All right, everyone, welcome back to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast and show here. So today, our special guest is my brother, Izana Teodros. And one thing I'm going to say in a little advance is when we do these episodes of histories, I'm going to be piggybacking on the giant named Dan Carlin of Hardcore History by saying that we are amateur historians, at least my brother Izana is studying it in the undergraduate level. I studied political science at the undergraduate level. And so you can say that, you know, it's related to history, but a lot of that history is more about government, international relations, and, you know, some of the people in power and all that thing. So it's history from a, a certain lens. All that is to say, we're bringing to you the spirit of the humanities, the idea of giving some sort of thought, giving some sort of opinion, the temerity of which sometimes is missing in academe today, while also trying to put facts at the forefront and trying to step out of whatever biases or prejudices we have. We don't pretend to be the ultimate arbiters of history, but we're just trying to get people excited to learn because him and I are students of history and we're super excited to learn. We're super excited to discuss. In the past, I've given a general survey of Ethiopian history, and I've also zoomed in on medieval church controversies. Today, I invited my brother Izana to talk to us about ancient Ethiopian history. So we're going to take it way back. Why don't you say hello to the good folks, Izana, and we could start off anywhere you'd like to in the deep past. Uh, thank you, uh, Henok. Uh, I appreciate you for having me. Uh, I just want to hope everybody's doing well during these uh, difficult times. You know, we're all struggling and everything. Uh, but to give uh, some background about myself, like Henok said, you know, <clears throat> being a interested in history is always great. Uh, me personally, I'm going to UC Berkeley uh, junior year. And I'm, I'm an econ student, like I, I'm studying econ, but on the side, I read about the history of Ethiopia and everything and Eritrea because it's so interesting. And I think it's really important that we don't make the same mistakes or we learn, you know, how important is our identity is. So um, basically what we're gonna cover in this uh, video is we're gonna talk about, like Kano said, from ancient times. So we're gonna talk from the beginning, like Dinkanesh or Lucy, and we're gonna go all the way to the, uh, I'd say the beginnings of Aksum, so around 300 to 400 BC or so. Uh, but yeah, anyways, so start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let, let, let's get into it. And it's funny, so, you know, we're generally talking about this region, which is now called the Horn of Africa. And in different times and in different places, there are so many different names. A lot of them, people are, you know, fighting. People are literally fighting each other. People are being, killed right now over mm -hmm. names over yeah. identity markers and so it's important that we go back to australopithecus right which is one mm -hmm. scientific way of saying it or lucy which is an anglicized mm -hmm. name or dinkanesh right which is an amhara sized name we're mm -hmm. talking about the same thing right one of the first erect human beings and so that's ultimately ultimately we have a shared humanity which we share yeah. with everyone on the planet earth and mm -hmm. so there are a lot of differences arises. And, and one of the hopes I think that uh, we share, I think I'm not being too bold in saying this, is that the study of history and the study of the common by like the common ties that bind us together is going to show us like when we zoom in on any beef or conflict, it's always of a specific time. We're always being biased by looking at a specific time period. By us winding back the clock millions of years, that's <laughs> making it somewhere. So what, what sort of estimates do they have for Dinkanesh? So Dinkanesh is around anywhere. Uh, the thing about history is like they have such wide like uh, time frames. So it can be anywhere from 3.2 to 3.9 million years ago, like give or take. Um, and so, I mean, that's just a that's just a brief overview of Dinkanesh. I think uh, many people are familiar in a sense of it and everything. Uh, but I want to talk about other things that maybe people don't know, and you know, just give a brief overview on those type of things. Um, so the next part we go on to after Dinkanesh is um, really the beginning of humanity or Homo sapiens, you know. And like when we talk about Homo sapiens. Uh, and this is some, this is a scientific term, it's called anatomically modern. And what that means by that, or is that the human has, human being has 
an exact anatomy, like how the organs are placed or everything and what's their functions and everything. So when it comes to that, um, the first anatomically uh, modern was found in Ethiopia near the Omo like uh, river and such. And this was around 200,000 years ago. And um, at, uh, even before that, what they also found was um, this, which, um, this type of uh, tipped pro uh, projectiles that were used for hunting and everything, showing really like pre, I mean, uh, showing what Homo sapiens would use in order to, you know, gather food and everything. And this was found actually even earlier, around 279,000 uh, years ago or so. And separate, this, separate from the, yeah, the separate, separate. anatomic humans. And and just a, yeah. a quick point, if I may, uh, the Lucy or Dinkanesh or Australopithecus is found mm -hmm. in the Afar region, yeah. right? Yeah. It's considered the hottest region on earth and it's mm -hmm. in the Northeastern portion. And that region, generally the Danakil is actually in part of what is the modern nation state of Eritrea, Ethiopia, as well as Djibouti. Some of the mm -hmm. borders that are drawn now are quite arbitrary and don't necessarily match all of the cultures. And, and generally that region is, is shared in that northeastern part, whereas the Omo Valley that our mm -hmm. brother is talking about is more in, in southern Ethiopia. Is that is yeah, that right? Southwest. Yeah, southwest, yeah. So um, with regarding like that and everything, um, yeah, one thing I, I do want to mention too is that as uh, before I go on is that, you know, this is, this is stuff, even though we're speaking everything, people should always research for themselves and always find the information for themselves. And that's very important. This is just given uh, to help facilitate you being interested in everything. But anyway, so going on to our uh, next point. So um, one thing that really helps, we see a lot of ethnic tension in Ethiopia and everything uh, right now, and especially for the last like uh, many years and one thing that um that really helps to realize you know what the differences but more so the similarities of ethiopians and humans in general is our genetics um so to get into ethiopian genetics i want to give like a brief overview about what genetics is and how we test that and how we find that so uh like Henok uh, was telling me the other day that he got a genetic test was it from uh, ancestry or 20 I used 23andMe. 23andMe, okay. So in that ancest, I mean that 23andMe uh, genetic testing, uh, it said like was 98% Ethiopian Eritrean and then 1%, I don't remember, was it Egyptian? Yeah, yeah. so it, um, the only thing that was intelligible was the Ethiopian slash Eritrean category. When you zoom into that, it's 0% Eritrean and it says uh -huh. everything for the past 10,000 years or so. And it tells you these are estimated figures has been mm -hmm. with in generally the region that is the current Ethiopian nation state. It had about less than, I think, 0.2 of 1%, which it had as unspecified European, which again is in the margin of error. And for people's examples, and other people, it would specify like Scottish, Irish, Italian, like it would specify a place, whereas mine says unspecified. And then it would say unspecified either Egyptian or Levantine, that kind of Sinaitic to Levantine area that includes like Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt. And again, that was an unspecified, whereas with other people, it would specifically say one of those regions. So both of those two, I think, are within, well within the margin of error. Yeah. Okay. So when it came to that kind of testing that Hanok did, there's, there's three types of main testing, and the the, for, the one he just did was called autosomal DNA. So what autosomal looks at looks at is we have like chromosomes on our uh, DNA and everything, and that looks at the chromosomes one through twenty two as well as the X chromosome. And what's the nice thing why it's so used when it comes to twenty three or me or ancestry is that it looks at it from both sides, so like the paternal and then the maternal side of it. So it's a it's a combination of both. And um, so this, are, this is why ethnicity estimates are often included with this sort of testing and et cetera. But there's also two types of testing that might not be as well known, and that's uh, Y chromosome or Y DNA. And this, this is just looking purely at the father's side, from father to son. And so it can only be taken from males and from their uh, direct paternal line. 
but on the flip side, there's this thing called mtDNA, which is mitochondrial DNA. And this is inherited from mother to the child. So it, it, either it can be a, a, a son or daughter, but it's from the mother's line. And it's looking at the DNA specifically from that. So one thing you have to understand, especially when it comes to um, Ethiopia, is the, or in general humans, is this out of Africa sort of, you know, um, theory or, uh, you know, you can believe it. So basically coming out of, you know, uh, mostly, the, I mean, say Northeast Africa or Ethiopian region, and then migrating all over the world and et cetera. That everyone is, everyone is African. I saw a podcast recently with Brett Weinstein, who's a Ashkenazi Jew, and everyone else on the podcast was black. And but some of them don't necessarily identify that way. And he was trying to say, does everyone at least admit that they're of African descent? And one of them reported, <laughs> we're all of African descent. And he's like, all right, you're right, you're right. Let me let me clarify. More recent African descent, recent <laughs> being within the past thousand years since I'm a biologist. So I think what he's out of saying is everybody's African. It's just a matter of did you leave Africa 100,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, or uh, maybe like our parents 30 to 40 years ago? Yeah. Maybe, it, actually, might be, yeah, my parents are almost at 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> my too, my too. Um, so when we look at this DNAs, and we're just going to be focusing on the Y DNA and the empty DNA because uh, autosomal is not, uh, that it wouldn't go really into depth that I, I think we need to look at. So when it comes to this is like, okay, humans are around 200,000 plus years old and et cetera. So when we look at uh, Y chromosomal DNA, uh, and this testing includes like hundreds of like Amaras, Oromos, Tigrayans, uh, Afar, Somalis, we find there are these different haplogroups. And now these haplogroups, what it means by haplogroup is a certain, you know, genetic uh, marker or whatever, whatever that's in your DNA. And when we look at them, the majority of these, uh, the majority of uh, the Ethiopian people are found in haplogroup E, and specifically E1B1B. And now they change the name to haplogroup E-P2. And this haplogroup or so is is first originated around anywhere from forty to fifty thousand years ago. So it's really you know it's really ancient, uh, like a lot of genetics and uh, testing. It's really old, to say the least. And when it comes to this, there's going to be, of course, discrepancies into how much E1B1B is. And what we see is that E1B1B is more found, um, it's mostly a Cushitic or a Hamatic gene. And what, what that means by Cushitic or Hamatic, and this is actually, you know, I'll, I'll cover, I'll wait into that, uh, what it means to be Cushitic or Hamatic, because that is a different subject. Uh, yeah, the linguistic categorization. Yeah, 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 linguistic, yeah. So... Uh, there might be variations of anywhere from like 30, 30, 40 to 70 percent of that exact gene. And the next gene we see that's of uh, high frequency is haplogroup J. And this haplogroup J is mostly found uh, in northern Africa, of course, but also, you know, in uh, Southwest Asia and, you know, the Southern Arabia and everything. And that's why you'll see like um, Jewish people or people of Semitic descent will have this haplogroup J as well as Ethiopians. We both have that same haplogroup J. And what we have to understand as well with these, you know, haplogroups is that there's even more further, you know, uh, it's a tree, like it keeps on going further and further down. Like it doesn't stop at just the one thing. And after that, you know, we have haplogroup uh, A, which is mostly a primarily like, uh, I would say a quote unquote African, you know, it's most, it's only, it's primarily found in, African uh, people who are from Africa or people in Africa. And that's around, you know, anywhere from 17% uh, or so. And then there's other ones that are haplogroup T and haplogroup B, and these are seven to three percent. So basically what to conclude, you know, these different haplogroups, I, five of them show, you know, what the Ethiopian people are in terms of genetics from the paternal side. And what it really shows is if you look at the, we'll post, uh, um, we should post the sources, I'll post the sources afterwards, I mean, on the video and everything. But what they show is that we have much more in commonality than we actually, we think, you know, and when they have the graphs and everything, you know, showing how close that Amara and Oromo is, like, 
like you can't the difference is like a, a a piece of hair like in terms of how separate it is so it's much more similar than it is different um and the next thing that we go into is the empty dna which is from like i said from the mitochondrial uh, dna or from the maternal side and in that same thing we have uh they have their own set of haplogroups you know uh for mtDNA and then for as well I mean for the the Y chromosomal. So in this mtDNA we have haplogroups uh, L through L0 through L6 so like L1 2 3 4 and that's around 50% of Ethiopians genetics and then after that we have haplogroup N and haplogroup MI. Um, so for the haplogroup N it's mostly exclusively found in Africa uh with variations of course and haplogroup n and haplogroup mi are found you know um in north north africa and northeast africa as well as western asia and southern arabia so that's really the genetic uh breakdown of what it is to be ethiopian and in all these findings you will find we are much more similar than different and that that really should be emphasized you know especially with all the tension that we have going on yeah, this is a point that Professor Emeritus Ephraim Isak, himself half Yemeni, half Ethiopian, would always make. And I've seen him make it on recent broadcasts as well. He does a phenomenal job when people try to pin him down. He says he believes in one God to obfuscate whether he's Jewish, Muslim, or Christian. When people say, what tribe you from, dog? He, you know, he'll say, I speak Oromo, Amharic, Tigrinya, Sidama, Afar, Somali, Gez. <laughs> and uh, so you know, he's a hard guy to pin down. And he, he draws on what you're saying, which is what I said earlier. Whenever we look at, you know, who does Addis Ababa or Finfinne belong to? Um, what's the difference between Semitic speakers and Cushitic speakers, Hamitic speakers, and Nilotic speakers? It's all about what time frame in history are we looking at? Are we looking at the past 50 years? Are we looking at the past 100 years? Are we looking at the past 300 years? I've seen different people make slideshows where they only look at the past 200 years. I've seen others make slideshows who have the past 300 or 400 years, different story. I've seen people who make slideshows from 1991 to right now, which is, uh, I won't speak on behalf of Zana, it's a little younger, but it's younger than me. The current regime is younger than me, and I like to remind people that. And today, with Zana, we've turned the clock back potentially millions of years, at a bare minimum, to the anatomic yeah. humans of a couple hundred yeah. thousand which yeah. is a different way of looking at it. And when you look at it that way, the differences are there, but negligible. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, that's the, really the beauty of it. And I, I hope really people try to learn that. And it's beyond fascinating, I think, you know, in terms of genetics and everything. And really, when you start to connect the, the dots, it's complicated at first to understand. It took me a while, but... When you get the general scope of it, you know, it's, it's really beautiful. Yeah, um, I can tell you a less rigorous scientific uh, study, but which is extremely anecdotal. So my family is overwhelmingly Amharic, but I do have Oromo and Tigrinya speakers in my family. And I have stories of, you know, of mixing in there. So, you know, like any Ethiopian, I'm sure I'm mixed. There's, there's no way I'm not. The most immediate people predominantly spoke Amharic, but again, I have very close family who speak Oromo and Tigrinya, uh, let alone other languages like Afar and Somali and Arabic and all the European stuff, which we don't have a background in. So I'm probably as Amharic as you can get, although even I have different things in me. So there was someone on the 23andMe site who said that they were pure 100% Oromo. And there was another guy who said he was pure 100% Somali, not even the ethnic Somali of Ethiopia, but a Somali from Somalia. So the three of us actually agreed to do an exchange. And according to, in my opinion, the colonial anthropologists that were the kind of foundation of Ethiopian studies, they, you know, view the Semitic speakers as these Arab invaders who, you know, oppressed and mixed in with all of the native indigenous Africans who are the Hamitic, Nilotic, and Cushitic people. So if that were the case, then the Oromo speaker or the person who identified as Oromo mostly and the person who identified as Somali mostly should have far more in common than me and either of those two people. What happened is they ended up sharing about 60% of their DNA history, whereas me and the Oromo person 
ended up sharing about 80% of our history. Now, again, this is extremely anecdotal, but it could mean one of two things in terms of conclusions. It could either mean that what we call Oromo and what we call Amhara are not that different, or it could mean that either I'm more Oromo than I thought, or the so, or the other guy is more Amhara than he thought, and then the, that thing which we were hiding in our family history is why we ended up having that more eighty percent. I'll let you all figure out what you think you know is more likely between those two, but those are the only conclusions from my very anecdotal study that I will use to dovetail Izana's more rigorous study. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the next thing, uh, we've been using the term, you know, Semitic, Kushitic, uh, Hamatic. Uh, so let's uh, really give a, you know, a brief re overview of that. So basically when it comes to, like we kept on mentioning how old humans are and how we completely divided in terms of linguistic or ethnic groups, one group that we see that uh, was born was the Afroasiatic group. And this Afroasiatic group uh, again, estimates can be anywhere from 10,000 to 15,000 years ago, was a group that originated in, you know, Northeast or Northern Africa and migrated into Asia. And a majority of those groups came back into Africa, settling in different areas. And the timeframes of the, them migrating back are, you know, differentiated between thousands of years or so. And within this uh, within, you know, when we look talk about genetics or linguistics or whatever, for a, a lot of things, there's obviously the commonality in the two. And we can look and compare those and see uh, how they relate. So, like, when we're talking about these different haplogroups from paternal and maternal, we can closely associate a, a Kushitic, you know, genome with the E1B1B and the Semitic with a J1. Um, but when it comes to the Afroasiatic, going back into the, we have uh, six different groups of people. And one is, of course, the Berbers. If you don't know the Berbers, they're in uh, Algeria, they're in Libya, Tunisia. It's basically, you know, North, North Africa. And the next people we have is the Egyptians, like the actual, you know, original Egyptians. <laughs> we was kings. Huh? Huh? We was kings. The chemical, <laughs> the Nubian Berbers. <laughs> Uh, so after where the whole temporary stems from. <laughs> after the Egyptians, we have uh, uh, the Omotic people, and after uh, Omotic is Kushitic, and then Semitic, and then also Chadic. And, and Omitic I, is the the valley you mentioned earlier, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah that area. Uh, and I didn't list those in any specific order in terms of dates or anything. I was just there's six different groups that we have to understand. Um, and of course, in Ethiopia since we're just focusing on e in Ethiopia, as well as this is Eritrea as well, uh, we find these three different groups. I mean, these three groups from that, and that's the Omotic people, the Semitic people, and the Cushitic people. And now what they say is that, like I mentioned before, is they came back at different times. So they say they can estimate the Omotic people, you know, came maybe anywhere from, you know, 10,000 to 13,000 years ago, they migrated, uh, back to Ethiopia and settling in the southern west uh, regions of Ethiopia. And we know these people now today as like the Walaita, the Gambo, uh, uh, Wofa, these are all Omotic groups. So these are the first people to come back really to Ethiopia. Um, after that, we have the Kushitic people. And the Kushitic people, uh, they say migrated back to Ethiopia anywhere from maybe 4,500, uh, uh, BC to six to seven thousand BC. Um, and so these Kushiri people that came back were obviously, you know, the uh, Oromos, Afars. They weren't uh, Oromos and Afars yet, but they were Kushiri. These Kushiri people that came back into Ethiopia and they evolved into these different uh, groups. Then, of course, what we have the last people to migrate back to Ethiopia were the Semitic people or Ethiopian people. And that involves, of course, into the groups that we know and today as Amara, Tigray, and um, Kurage. Kurage, and uh, Tigra, Gafat, you know, Argoba, or Gafat's extinct. But, um, and this was anywhere from uh, 
you can say 3000 BC to 1000 BC or so. So we all, the Ethiopian people all came back at different times. And I do want to mention, of course, there's another group in Ethiopia that's, you know, their own subgroup, like, I mean, their own group, and that's the Nilotic people. So that's the Anwak, the Hamir, everything. Of course, there's only like the total. Gam Gambela is a part of that. Gam Gam yeah, Gambela, Beni Shangul. Uh, num there's numerous groups. Um, in terms of those groups, those people stayed in Africa. They didn't migrate out into Asia or anything. They stayed in Africa. And that's why, really, there's that belief, that Afro-Asiatic belief that uh, the majority of the Ethiopian people migrated out of Ethiopia and came back. Because if we didn't migrate or anything, then there wouldn't be really a genetic or linguistic difference between us and the Nilo-Saharan people or Nilotic people, um, who are, of course, settled now and today, you know, in the Sudan, South Sudan, and, you know, Western Ethiopia. So when it comes to those things, um, those migrations and everything, uh, we have to look at, you know, it w they all these different people set settled in different areas and they even, like uh, like I said, they diversified themselves. Like even within Kushidik, we have lowland East Kushidik, we have highland East Kushidik. And like, um, so like the Oromos and Somalis are from one, like they're, they're more closely associated with each other whereas the Afaz and Saho are more closely associated with each other and everything. And I wanted to pause there because sometimes people make this northern invader, uh, southern oppressy distinction. And the issue is the Semitic people are both in the north and in the south. Yes, right. Yeah. Ha Harari, mm -hmm. or um, I believe in their own language, it's called Geso. Um, yeah. Harari or Adarinya or Geso and Gurage or Guraginya are Semitic languages in the south. In the mm -hmm. north, you have the Tigrinya and the Amharic. You mm -hmm. mentioned the Somali and the and the um, excuse me and the Oromo as more southern Kushitic languages. In the north, you have Afar and you have Ageu. Like yeah, so it's, very it's not a clean cut, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, to add on top of this is we see a huge admixture, um, especially. Um, and this is what well, we're talking about time frame now. We're talking when the, the Ethiosemitic people uh, first start, came and everything. We see a huge admixture between the Ethiosemitic and the Kushida people. Uh, and if you look at the going back to the. Ad admixture means they're having babies. Yeah, they're having a lot of babies. <laughs> and when we look, referencing back to that genetic uh, testing, we see a lot of Tigrayans and Beja people who are Kushidic have a lot of like admixture, there's a lot of genetic overlap. And the same thing, of course, comes with the Amaras and the Agos. The Amaras and the Agos have a lot of uh, genetic overlap. Um, so, and this further, hap this this kept on happening, you know, when uh, Oromo expansion happened and they started to mix with other uh, Ethiopian people and everything. So everybody just keeps on mixing. Everybody keeps on, you know, uh, <laughs> their genetics keeps on changing and everything. And, and for a picture of people, I mentioned this in another video, but the Oromo during the expansion from the 1500s onwards expanded as north as Raya, which is on the border of Wello, northern Wello, southern Tigray, and mm -hmm. then as south as like southeast Kenya. So it's a yeah. vast amount of land. Everyone yeah. but, you know, some of the northern points and midpoints of Eritrea is likely got some Oromo in them within this admixture that Izana's talking yeah. about. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, but, you know, pulling it back, I want to focus on the Ethiosemitic because there's a, people might say, you know, invaders or everything. But uh, when we look at the Ethiosemitic, so the proto, you know, before their Amara, Kuragi, Tigray, or whatever. Um, what happened is, okay, when it came to the Kushidic or Omotic people, their most likely migration back to Ethiopia was through like Egypt and Sudan and then, you know, into Ethiopia. But when it came to the Ethiosemitic people, they went the opposite way. So they went down into Arabia from Southern Arabia and then back into the Northern, Northeast Ethiopia and everything. So when it came to this, um, this is a, there was, and this is going to, we're going to tie this back into the Bible and everything, but the Ethiosemitic books are early Southern Semitic was composed of five different types of people. And this was the Agazian, 
بحبشات، the hadramot، the himyar، and the sabian. And all these different groups, uh, as we know, there's sabian in inscriptions in northern Ethiopia and everything. Uh, all these different groups were intermingled with each other and everything, and migrated into Ethiopia, and uh, for reasons we don't know, somehow chose Ge'ez as their language, which is from the Agazian, uh, you know, group. I, uh, well, Ge'ez. the script is Sabaean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and one thing I do want to make a distinction is that people, uh, the earlier historians used to say uh, Ge'ez came from Sabian or stuff, but that's not true. It, of course, they were close to it in terms of you know, because uh, uh, they're from the South, same South Semitic group, but it did not directly, you know, come from the Sabian group or everything. And that's also a confusion that we see amongst Ethiopians is that they will say, oh, I'm half Arab and half black or something like that. Uh, but it, it's not as simple as that. What we have to understand is that the all the Kushidic, uh, Semitic and Omotic people that are from Ethiopia directed, it descended from their own line their own people and everything. And we all have a common branch. Like when it comes to the Semitic people, we have the common branch with the Jews and the Arabs, but that doesn't mean we're descended from them. We're just all descended and we split off at different times and points. So that's one thing that uh, people should uh, really try to understand. Um, so what the next thing I, I do want to talk about is um, Ethiopia and the Bible, or also, you know, we talk about the, uh, actually, before I want to, uh, before we get into that, let's talk about the kingdom of Punt. I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the kingdom of Punt was anywhere, lasted from 3,500 to BC to um, maybe 2,000 BC, 1,500 BC. Again, with the dates, you know, it's give or take, you know, a couple hundred years here and there. And what we know is the kingdom of the Punt, uh, kingdom of Punt, is that it was situated mostly uh, in, of course, Eritrea, uh, northern Ethiopia, um, Djibouti, and Somalia. So it encompassed all this land. And the historical evidence that we have for this kingdom of Punt is from the Egyptians, and the Egyptians hier hieroglyphics and everything, and they describe, you know, how they had. Kingdom of Punt means like land of the gods by the Egyptians. And and their hieroglyphics and everything, they have, you know, huge extensive trade depicting the trade that occurred between Punt and uh, the Egyptians and everything. And, you know, one of the main, the biggest exp expedition that happened during that period was in, around the 15th century BC. So uh, 1500 BC. And then uh, I always have issues start, uh, pronouncing her name, but Queen uh, Hatshep, Hatshepsut. Oh my gosh, I butchered it. <laughs> yeah, Hatshepsut. I, I want to jump in here just to say, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you look at the beautiful map that Izana has behind him. It's one of the ones that we grew up on. And there's an Ethiopian artist named Burnt Face. Shout out to you, Elias. And he taught me, you know, years ago through his music, through his his art form, one of these things, which is to begin questioning the map. I later learned about the various projections people have and learned first off that they intentionally undersize the general size of Africa on a lot of these projections. So you can search different projections to see mm -hmm. what the actual, you know, size and scope of Africa is. The second mm. thing is that the earth is a globe that is always uh, spinning. Sorry, flat earth. <laughs> and so the reason that's important is which way we think about as a direction is mm -hmm. very arbitrary and subjective. We grew up with this European mindset. And so we think of it every, like north is this way, south is this way, and that's up and that's down and this and that. But when talking about the ancient Egyptians who are talking about this land of the gods, you have to remember that water is life. And one of the greatest sources of life for the Egyptians, ancient and modern, has been the Nile, which, you know, <laughs> shout out to Ethiopia. We just uh, got that Nile dammed up. Uh, you don't give a damn, don't throw it up. But uh, the reason I bring that up is that the Nile River flows from south to north. For an American example, in America, the great Mississippi River flows north south whereas the nile flows south to north this means going down the river in america means going south but going down the river in ethiopia and in egypt means traveling from south to north 
which means that from the orientation, from the maps, from the point of view of the ancient Egyptians, this land of the gods that Izan is talking about was actually, in their mind, Upper Egypt. And Upper Egypt was towards the south. So that's just one example of many of how, when you're interpreting history, the lenses, the kind of biases you bring to the table are flavoring that. And as much as possible, you got to aim for neutrality and objectivity, as he mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you can jump back into... No problem, no problem. Um, so that's just a brief overscope of the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of Punt. Um, again, uh, when it comes to Ethiopian history, especially the earliest times, there's so much more research that needs to be done. And um, hopefully, you know, younger, the young generation can do that um, because we're really left in the dark when it comes to certain things. Um, and this is just based off what we know as of right now. And hopefully we find more information, but. Um, in terms of like writing, right? Because he's talking about hieroglyphs, which exist, yeah, not yeah, that yeah. many, not that many groups. The Gu'ez or the Agazian are the first group that have writing in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Nobody else has yeah. writing. There's no Amharic writing. There's no Tigrinya writing. There's no Oromo yeah. writing. There's no Gurage writing, no Harari or Geso. There's nothing, no Aga, yeah. no, no Beja. Yeah. It's all yeah. Gu'ez and yeah. before Gu'ez, we don't have anything in writing. So we're, yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah, especially the ar archaeological um, evidence that really needs to be, you know, done and everything. Uh, but going into the next part, so Hanok uh, briefly touched about it, you know, about like uh, these discrepancies in the maps and everything. And one thing that um, that definitely is always confusion is, and this is going back into Ethiopia and the Bible, is this this term Kush or Ethiopian. And um, as we know, a lot of people say, oh, Ethiopia comes from Aetopia's uh, burnt face from Greek, uh, which is something I, <laughs> I highly disagree with because Ethiopia is uh, much more uh, ancient than that. And um, as we know, like what the Ethiopians say or their um, argument against that is that, no, it comes from the book of Aksum and that Ethiopia is the son of Kush. And as we know, Kush is a biblical figure as long as side Ham and Shem. And this is where we get those terms, Kushidic, Hamatic, Semitic, and everything. Um, so one thing that we talk about is that, you know, Ethiopia, they say, encompasses, you know, it can encompass anywhere from India, you know, Egypt, every, all these different areas. This is ridiculous. Um, but what one thing that does need to be mentioned is that there was definitely a close relationship when it came to uh, Southern Egypt, or even Egypt in general, uh, modern day Sudan, of course, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, Djibouti, Somalia, and also Southern Arabia. There was definitely a close relationship with that. And my hypothesis is, or like something that I, I hope is definitely research is that with this cooperation, there could have been power shifts where, you know, certain rulers were where, where uh, ruling over, like let's say the Ethiopians were ruling over the Southern uh, Southern Arabians or over the Sudanese and everything. And this predates even Aksum uh, when we had a great uh, historical expansion in terms of land. So, and one thing that is defined in the Bible especially is that it says Ethiopia as our, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the, what, the Gion, uh, the, Ethiopia, like Ethiopia, I mean, the land of Ethiopia is encompassed by like the, the river of Gion or whatever. And one thing that's hold dear, uh, of course, you know, because I'm with Jami is that Gion is Abba, you know. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> also like uh, this one thing is like the original Ethiop Ethiopia is with Jam itself. Um, and that's one thing that people don't highlight on is that we do have um, what the original land of Ethiopia is. And it's that surrounding of Gwajan and Abba and everything. Um, so that's that's one thing uh, that gets into the Bible and everything. And what that follows is the Queen of Sheba, of course, or uh, Makeda or um, uh, Queen of Saba, as they say. Um, so a lot of people would like uh, say, oh, the Solomonic dynasty, you know, it actually started in 1270 and blah, blah, blah. Kabra the glory of the kings is not historically accurate. Uh, but again, uh, going back into genetic testing, um, they have found that around anywhere from 950 to 1000 BC, that there was huge genetic inflow from Levant. And we said earlier, Levant is, you know, the areas of Israel, uh, Syria, 
Jordan, that kind of area. And these and those genetic, genetic markers of the Ethiopians is that they found a, a genetic mixture from that specific time and area as well. So not only do we have the Kibra Negus as evidence regarding that, we also have it regarding genetics as well, science. And the Kibra Negus, for those who don't know, it's kind of a national mythology book, which means the glory of kings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's it's very, uh, very important to say, because that, that legitimizes what we, the Ethiopian people, have believed in. Um, so that's that's it for the soul. I'm not going to cover, you know, the Solomonic dynasty. Uh, so we'll, uh, to give a brief overview for you, for those of you that might not know, the Solomonic dynasty basically roots that King Solomon, the leader of uh, Israel or Judah, tribe of Judah, um, was visited by the Queen of Saba or the, um, the ruler of Ethiopia and, you know, Southern Arabia and everything. And they, you know, they had a kid and that kid is Emperor Menelik. Uh, the first. The, <laughs> the first. <laughs> and Emperor Menelik uh, basically went and uh, took the Ark of the Covenant from King Solomon, which is, of course, uh, currently located in uh, uh, Aksum. Along with several male and female servants or slaves. <laughs> and, um, so that's just a brief uh, story. And basically what that meant is King Solomon saw it, and this is detailed in the Kura Negus, is that God has chosen Ethiopia and the, the people of Ethiopia as its holy land and holy people, or the chosen people. And the later Zagwe folks claim their heritage <laughs> from the, the slaves, right? <laughs> from the, yeah, the, the issue is, uh, well, is uh, one of the escorts uh, had, uh, had a kid with King uh, Solomon as well. That's the, the Zagwe propaganda. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically, when we talk after the Solomonic dynasty, or actually current or co currently, what was happening is that before Aksum, we had this thing called the Kingdom of Damat. And this was situated, and of course, you know, uh, Eritrea or northern Ethiopia. And this could range anywhere from 1000 to 400 BC. And uh, at the time, in terms of uh, also Ethiopia, of course, religion is a huge aspect in Ethiopia, uh, the probably the most important aspect. Um, what we see in Ethiopia during that time is that from the influence of the Queen of Sheba, as well as Southern Arabian influence, is that we have two religions pretty much going on. It's that two main religions. We have the Judaism, or, or the belief of God and everything, and then we have the paganistic belief of the Southern Arabian gods and the different types of gods they have, might have. Sun god, snake Sun god, god, the the much beloved obelisks that people have in their homes. They don't realize that their pagan imagery of fertility and virility that's supposed to be, you know, sex uh, sacrifices that are a part of any of these polytheistic religions of the time of that of that milieu as you described. Yeah. Um, so what we have is. Uh, of course, at Yeha in Tigray, is that there's this uh, famous uh, shrine, temple or shrine uh, dedicated to God, that one of the gods, and that's uh, An Maka. And I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But um, uh, what they say is, you know, that Amlak derives from that. Um, so our term for a god, you know, derives from, you know, <laughs> a pagan god, basically. Um, but so, of course, after the kingdom of Damat, we don't know, we're not sure if it transformed into the Aksumite Empire or the Aksumite Empire came just out of its own and everything. Uh, and this was, Aksumite Empire started around 300 BC to 400 BC or so. And um, that's for another day. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get into Aksumite Empire yet. I think we uh, covered enough for today and everything. And uh, one... Uh, folk story I do want to tell is that even before Damat in the 13th century BC, or actually even earlier than that, is that the Ethiopians used to worship this serpent god sort of thing. And <laughs> and one of the... Which is likely from Persia. From yeah. Persia and yeah. trade. Yeah. yeah, and uh, one of the, the rulers uh, killed the, the serpent and everything and became the ruler of, the, of modern day Ethiopia and Eritrea, etc. Uh, but Basically, what we just covered was a brief overview of Ethiopian and uh, Horn of Africa, I'd say, um, history all the way from millions of years ago until 
400 BC, but yeah. From the ancients to the Aksumites, and we give you that cliffhanger of the Aksumites. Thank you so much, Shizana, for being with me today, and hopefully we'll get you back to talk about the the Aksumites if we don't get you replaced with another professor. And uh, I hope people just watch this and are excited that realize that we're coming at it from a place of humility, that if there are any factual errors in anything we said, you know, we are not claiming to be the ultimate arbiters of the truth, but inviting you to have resources. I'm going to have Izana email me whatever resources he likes. I'm going to throw it up on YouTube and you all could look into the facts there. Please comment, share, talk about it, keep the discussion going, and we'd love to learn more. And of course, my platform is always open. All right. Great, great. Thank you so much, Enoch.